Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. And by No Foods. No grain, no gluten, no guilt. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, how are those fitness resolutions going? We're going to talk about staying on track and avoiding common pitfalls. The woman behind Diabetes Strong, formerly the Fit Blog, says you got to have a plan. Going for a walk or vacuuming is something that can really, really make your blood sugars plummet. It's freaking annoying, but that's the way it is, right? But we can then never go for a walk again or vacuum. <laughs> but that's not really an option either, right? So instead, try and figure out, well, what can we do proactively to prevent us going low. But you can't plan for everything, so how can you still get the most of your exercise and fitness routine? My conversation with personal trainer and coach, Christelle Oram. Plus, what really is an A1C? Why did doctors start using it? A little history in our Now You Know segment. And on a personal note, my family is hitting all sorts of milestones. I'll tell you why we're talking about college. Oh, yeah. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to another week of Diabetes Connections. If you are new to the show, we aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connections. We talk to celebrities and artists and athletes, as well as everyday people just living with diabetes. Also have conversations with the healthcare companies and the tech groups that keep moving us forward down the road. And that's one of the really fun things about this show. I get to have conversations with all sorts of different people, you know, all died together by, um, by having diabetes or being in the community. My son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes just before he turned 2. That was 11 years ago. My husband does have type 2 diabetes. I don't have diabetes, but I have a background in radio and television news. That was my career for many, many years. And that's how you get the podcast. Do me a favor as you listen. If you're listening on social media or on a podcast app, go ahead and go to Facebook and join the Facebook group if you haven't already. It's Diabetes Connections, the group, and it's becoming a, a really fun place to be on Facebook. You know, last week, I had asked people there to help me figure out a hashtag for an upcoming social media campaign. And I'm putting some posts and pictures over there that I'm not putting on the main page. You know, there are a lot of diabetes face groups. And I get that um, you might be thinking, well, why join one more? Uh, I do a whole presentation on Facebook groups now. Some of them are great. Some of them are a little scary. Some are huge. And not that there's anything wrong with that. But um, this one is going to be different in that it comes from this podcast. So it'll be fun to see who the audience is for it. I'm uh, asking a couple of questions. If you want to join, you will be asked a couple of questions just to help filter out people who, you know, aren't in the diabetes community or may never have heard of the podcast. Um, there are lots of other nice groups for those people. So please uh, answer the questions and we'll pop you in. Please check that out. Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Have you ever tested your blood sugar with a meter and were sure about the meaning of your result? Take the guesswork out of your numbers with the OneTouch Vario Flex Meter. It uses color sure technology to instantly show you when you or your loved one's blood sugar numbers are low, indicated by blue, in range, green, or high, that's red, so you can quickly get on with your life. You can also use the meter's built-in Bluetooth smart technology to seamlessly sync with the OneTouch Reveal mobile app, available now as a free download for Android devices on Google Play, and Apple devices on the App Store. One touch, because taking a step forward starts with seeing where you are. How are those New Year's resolutions going? How crowded is your gym? right this time of year. Well, I pinched a nerve in my neck over the winter holidays. Fun. So I'm just walking. Um, I'm just moving around that way, walking my dog and doing some treadmill stuff. No weights for me right now. I got to wait to get better for that. But if you're really wanting to work out, you're feeling overwhelmed, maybe you're already discouraged, or maybe you, you've started and you really want to keep going, my guest today is here to help. Christelle Aurum has been living with type 1 diabetes since 1997, and she is passionate about strength training and healthy nutrition. 
Christelle's website is Diabetes Strong, formerly known as The Fit Blog, and they have everything from articles to advice to personal coaching. Right now, they're in the middle of a Fit with Diabetes Challenge. They do a couple of those throughout the year. Christelle is a certified personal trainer. She's originally from Denmark. We talk about that in the interview, and now she's in LA. I started off, though, by asking her about her diagnosis story. Oh, I was diagnosed. So my 20th anniversary was in December. Mm. So uh, I was diagnosed at 19. Now you know how old I am. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> it was fairly undramatic, which I guess is a good thing. I was, you know, I was showing symptoms. I was very tired. I could eat a box of ice cream every night without gaining weight, which was awesome at 19. But I was really tired and I was drinking a lot and all that. And my family sort of started to worry and they urged me to go to see my, my primary care doctor. So I did. And he gave me the whole spiel about you're 19, you should sleep more, you should eat right. And then he tested my blood sugar. And it was, of course, something ridiculous. I, I don't remember how much it was, sure. but he basically just told me, hey, you have diabetes. And then he sent me home. Did he explain what type? Did he go into any detail? No, not really. He must have found it safe enough to just send me home. I mean, I wasn't DKA or anything. I wasn't a walking skeleton. Mm. So I still looked fairly healthy, you know, on the, on the slimmer side. But still, anyway, he, he just sent me home. And I was on my bicycle. And I bicycled home. And I remember all the way home thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to die. Oh. Because I had no clue. I had never, I didn't know anybody with diabetes. I didn't know what it was. So luckily, it was a shorter <laughs> bike ride. But I came home. And I'm fortunate enough that, well, my mother is a nurse and she understood and still does understand diabetes as she could sort of explain it to me. So she talked it over with me. I then understood I'm not dying, at least not, you know, not from diabetes and not right now. Um, and then we went and saw a specialist, but not until the Monday after. So I was basically, you know, at home over the, the weekend with no treatment, which now in retrospective, I find a little weird. But anyway, um, everything went fine, and my mom and I went and saw a specialist, and that was actually a good experience. And it's something that I, I like to highlight because I think anybody who works with people with diabetes, and especially newly diagnosed, should be aware of the impact that makes. Because I was put in front of a nurse, Lada, and the first thing she would have said was like, this is a major bummer, this sucks, but you can still do whatever you want. Oh, that's great. It was awesome. I mean, it stuck with me. I and uh, I had a backpacking trip to India planned, you know, within the next, I think it was six months, six to eight months of my diagnosis. And she's like, you're going. Of course you are. Wow. And I went. And all things, all sort of things went wrong. But, you know, I, I survived and it was still a great trip. And that's kind of been what I've taken with me all through my 20 years with diabetes is there's nothing I can't do. I have to be smart about things, but, you know. Mm -hmm. You are from Denmark, right? Yes. You're, okay, so you were living in Denmark when you were diagnosed, and I was struck by the fact that you jumped on your bicycle and went home. <laughs> were you always into fitness and, and cycling, or is that something that people just do in Denmark? <laughs> I feel so dumb yeah. asking. <laughs> no, 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 it's totally fair. Um, and I should have incorporated that in the story. Yes, born and raised in Denmark, uh, lived there until 2009, where I moved to the U.S. I've been in use for U.S. for eight years. Um, yes, everybody pretty much, well, almost everybody in Denmark uses their bikes as a mean of transportation. Uh, it's a tiny country. It's fairly flat. And the infrastructure for bicycling is really, really good. So I actually did not get a driver's license until I turned 29. Wow. And that was only because I was coming to U.S. for school. And in, I was going to be in L.A. where I now live. And I knew I was, I was going to need it, you know, to be able to drive a car. Okay, I remember it in the back of my mind somewhere, knowing that the, the cycling <laughs> was really good in Denmark, that it was a real mode of transportation. It's not like here where the bike lane is two inches wide. So I'm, I'm yeah. glad I remembered to ask that. Uh, before we <laughs> even talk about your you know, diabetes strong and everything else, what's it like to move to L.A. from Denmark? I can't even imagine. It's different. <laughs> I, would say, I mean, um, so my husband and I moved to the U.S. together, and we actually start out in San Francisco. Okay. So San Francisco is a little more Scandi-ish. Mm. Uh, I know that's not a word, but um, like a little Scandinavian? More, is that what? Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, it's small, it's walkable. It's actually a lot of people from Scandinavia there. So that was an easy. It was sort of a transition city into living in the U.S. And then we moved down to L.A. 
It's well, it's different, but I really like it here. I am by the beach. I love it. I love the weather. Most of the people are really nice, and it's as with anywhere in the world. If you find good people where you're at, everything is going to be okay. Why did you all move here? So、um, back in 2009, my husband got a job offer that took us to the U.S. So I left my job at that point and moved with him. Fantastic. And it's something that we've been talking. I think we talked about it on our first date back in 99, which is a long time ago.、Um, <laughs> we kind of <laughs> talked about we wanted to travel the world and live elsewhere. So it's it's been a long time coming, but you know it it happened. That's great. Okay, so you now have Diabetes Strong, which used to be called the Fit Blog, which is a huge uh, health uh, wellness diabetes website.、Um, you've got contributors from all over the world. How did that start? Was it something that you felt there was really a need because you were enjoying your life with type one and wanted others to do as well? Tell us how how it started. Sure. I mean, it's a little bit of both.、Uh, what you said that. So it's. Started out with you know after living in San Francisco, my husband and I, Tobias, we moved to Los Angeles, Santa Monica, which is kind of like the I feel like a fitness mecca of,、uh, <laughs> of the West Coast. And I got really intrigued, and I started working out at Gold's Gym down in Venice, you know the、wow. original bodybuilder gym. And I got so into it, and I was like, this is what I want. I want you know build an incredible physique. I want to you know take my fitness to the next level. And you know, living with diabetes, it's not just about going to the gym and eating the right food and all that. There's also the diabetes component. So me being me, I'm fairly analytical, structured. I just went online. I was like, I'm just going to Google this. I'm going to find all the resources. I'm going to be right there, and I'm going to implement. And that was not the case. So back in in 2013, 14, I, I went online. I didn't find the resources for okay, how do I successfully, you know. Combine this fitness journey I'm in with my diabetes. So, I mean, there's a few scientific papers, high level. There's something for like endurance athletes and stuff like that, but nothing that sort of suited my needs. So I started this tiny little blog, which nobody really read except for my mom. But you know, I, just, <laughs> I had one of those for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You start somewhere, but basically, it was just me documenting my journey. Documenting my findings because I was like, okay, I'm still going to do this because of course I am. So I just started documenting. Well, what happens when I do different kinds of exercise with my blood sugars?、Uh, how does different kind of foods impact me and all those things? And I started writing. And at one point, Tobias again, the husband,、um, looked at it and he's like, "There's something here." And we started talking about, you know, what if I couldn't find it? And I'm not super unique. I mean, I'm just. Person with type one who really wants to exercise and do it in the right way, and I was creating some really cool tools. So with his help, we st- we created what was back then the Fit Block, which was basically, yeah, as you said, it's a website, fitness and health website back then for people living with diabetes who wanted my take on these are the trends I saw. This is how you can find your own trends, and this is how you can implement. I'm a, I'm very much a how-to girl.、Mm. And、the site grew, which kind of tells me that we were filling a void. Yeah. Because again, I was not the only one out there googling and not finding anything, right? So, so it's just it continued to grow, and as you said, we have other people、uh, writing on the site as well for multiple amount of reasons. First of all, I get I can get a little tired of you know hearing myself talk all the time, so it's nice <laughs> to have other voices. Also, I don't know everything, right? And we also wanted the site to be broader and include. Mental health. I should not be writing about mental health. So we managed to get folks in who have the right backgrounds to write about that. And the same thing, you know, if you're an older adult, some of the things that you might like joint pains and stuff like that, I don't have experience with that yet. So we pulled in people who have experience with that, and that's kind of how we kept growing and. And Tobias and I have been working on it full time now since 2015. So it's been two and a half years. The, the last add on to that would just be we we just recently I think two yeah here in、um, November early November we changed the name to DiabetesStrong.com, and it's just I feel like that represents what the site is so much better than the old name. So it's still the same content. It's now now it's also packaged. 
in a way that actually represents what it is. And it's that beauty strength, not just physical, but also the mental part is the, the whole package. That's great. So at this time of year, the mm-hmm. gyms get crowded. People make their resolutions. <laughs> I think people are still sticking with them at this point. You know, some have, uh, some are in it for the long mm-hmm. haul. Some are already done. But let's go through a little bit of advice if we could pick your brain uh, just generally. I don't want to give away all the secrets. <laughs> but, you know, there are so many different types of exercise. Let's say somebody is starting out, and we're speaking here people with type 1. So if you're okay. starting out, you're going to add some cardio. You know, I'm going to run a 5K in March, and mm-hmm. I'm starting now. What are some easy ways to make sure that you do it without too much upheaval to your type 1? Any tips? And we'll hear her advice in just a moment. Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And one of the best things about using the Dexcom G5 mobile CGM system is that share function. As a parent, caregiver, friend, spouse, whatever, you can use a separate Dexcom follow app and help the person you care about manage diabetes in real time. As a parent, that gives me so much peace of mind. And even as we change things up, you know, as Benny gets older to give him more independence, but it's an amazing safety net. And you can use the Dexcom G5 mobile CGM system with iOS or Android now, as long as there's an internet connection. The Dexcom G5 mobile is the only CGM approved for adults and children ages two and older with diabetes. Do not make treatment decisions based upon share and follow readings. Always confirm with your compatible smart device or Dexcom receiver. For more information, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Now back to my talk with Christelle, and she's talking about planning. Um, sure. I think maybe even taking a step further back than that and say, okay, well, what is it that you want to do? So you say, okay, run a 5K in March. That's a great goal. Then break that down into smaller goals because you're not going to go out and run 5K day one if you never run before, right? So it's gradually, you know, adding more and more miles to your run over the next three months. And as you do that, I would highly suggest that you start tracking what happens to your blood sugars whenever you go for these runs. And this is not just tracking what's happening after, it's collecting enough information so that you can start seeing trends for exactly how your diabetes reacts to these runs, also as they get longer and longer. Mm. Um, And well, I do have tracking sheets and all that good stuff uh, on the website. Uh, I, I call it finding your formula. And what the way that I describe it is that we're all humans. And if we have one type one diabetes, we all have this different components of our formula, which is insulin, you know, activity, what food we eat and a thousand other things. But we all have a formula. We're all humans. We all swing within the same patterns. However, how drastically we'll swing will depend on the individual. And that's when we come down to finding a formula. So what I suggest is that people start tracking blood sugars before, if possible, blood sugars during and blood sugars after um, exercise. Also be aware that exercise often impacts blood sugars up to 48 hours after Mm. you're done. So it's probably not enough to just measure blood sugars five minutes after your workout. Um, And then start tracking some of the other components as well. Okay, what did you eat before? How much insulin did you take? So how much insulin did you have on board when you went for your run? So in general, that can be hard <sighs> if you, well, it is hard. I'm not saying it's easy, right. but in general, if you go for a run 5 a.m. one day and you didn't eat before, and then you go for a run 7 p.m. the day after and you ate right before, this is not going to be comparable data, right? So I suggest that you track these things, but you also try to, eliminate as many variables as possible. So for example, stick with the same time of day for your workouts, try eating the same thing before and after and the same, roughly the same amount of insulin. So if you take, if you eat your breakfast, you go for your run and you go low and you start seeing that as a pattern, well, then you know you'll need less insulin with breakfast in order for you to not go low during your run. What about exercise like resistance training? which is a little mm-hmm. bit different. Same thing, just keep tracking and keep watching? Same thing, but I mean, I think 
a basic thing to know, or the key thing to know, let's call it that instead, is that for cardio exercise, meaning that your heart rate goes up, stay pretty, uh, pretty flat, blood sugars will tend to decrease. For resistance training or anaerobic exercise, which is also sprints, stuff like that, blood sugars tend to go high or flat line during exercise, and then they might they can potentially plummet after. Mm. So knowing that also means that, well, now you need to apply a different strategy. So if you go for a run, you might need to reduce your insulin prior to going for your run. Well, if you went, would go and do resistance training, and I'm not I'm talking about like lifting weights, you might need to take your full dose or maybe even a little bit more, but reduce after, right? So it's still about finding the trends and you can do that by tracking. If you have three to four data points, so three to four days where you did roughly the same thing, you should see a pattern and you should be able to start making tweaks safely, of course. Right. <laughs> All right. So I'm a person who doesn't have diabetes and it's uh-huh. enough of a pain for me to go and get myself to the gym. I can't imagine with all these other challenges that there aren't a lot of people with type one who are saying, see, look how hard it is. You know, this is a, this is discouraging. Oh, um, yes. How do you it get past hard. that? Well, I mean, the good news is that it takes some upfront work, but when you have your base formula down, you have to tweak it over time, obviously. But when you have your base formula down, it gets so much easier. And not only that, I mean, not only does it get easier, it also gives you that peace of mind. It's like, for example, for me, I've been doing this for a while now. I know. I just, I know when I go into the gym, if my blood sugar is, say, 100, and I have maybe, if I have less than an active unit of insulin on board for resistance training, I'm good. I just, I know based on experience. But you only get that experience and that knowledge and that peace of mind if you put in the work. So, and the other thing is, I mean, how, so just something like go for a walk, that's technically cardio. I think most people with type one will agree that going for a walk or vacuuming (laughs) is something that can really, really make your blood sugars plummet. It's freaking annoying, but that's the way it is, right? But we can then never go for a walk again or vacuum. Um, but, (laughs) uh, But that's not really, that's not really an option either, right? So instead, try and figure out, well, what can we do? proactively to prevent us going low. So there's two levers, right? You can eat carbohydrates, you can chuck your you know, glucose tabs, or you can reduce your insulin. That's the two levers. So what I suggest is, well, find out for you what works. And I usually say, if you're going for less than an hour of cardio, I don't see any reason why you need to quote unquote carb up. Mm. In my perspective is, well, if you go low during your half hour walk or run, it probably means you have too much insulin on board. And again, we all go for walks, even if it's just from our car to the grocery store and back. So just learning your formula helps you not just for exercise, but for general life. And if we want to be healthy and if we want to, you know, if we really want to follow through with what I said before is I really believe there's nothing we can't do if we're smart about it. Right. Yeah. So it just it allows some some flexibility. It allows us to be living. Um, gosh, there's so much I could ask you here. There are a lot of different trends always mm-hmm. with exercise, with diet, uh, nutrition. Uh, you know, things kind of come and go. Are there any basics mm-hmm. that you have over the last 20 years of doing this that you really find yourself saying, you know, there are there's not a shortcut here. You have to do this. Well, it depends on your goals, obviously. Mm-hmm. And my goals have evolved over the last 20 years as well. Um, but in general, it's like figure out what it is you want to do with your health and then make a plan. So let's say it's building more muscle mass because muscle mass is awesome and muscle mass improves insulin sensitivity. In general, I found that that makes diabetes management easier as well. Well, you know, you need to figure out how do you do that? How do you eat right for muscle building? How do you, you know, what do you need to do in the gym? Or maybe you're doing it at home. And then set up like shorter goals for achieving that in general. And you mentioned that, you know, people are in the gym right now. A lot of people won't be in the gym in two to three months. Right. That's often because people don't have a plan. Hmm. So you need to have a plan for your health, but you also need to have a plan for your your diabetes management. Right. Yeah. 
most often when people come to me and say, I don't have any trends, my blood sugars are all over the place. It's often because, well, first of all, people don't know what I just told you before about, you know, anaerobic and aerobic exercise and how that impacts blood sugars. And if you don't know that there's a difference, then yes, it seems mighty random. And the other thing is that people don't track. So that's back to finding your formula. And if you don't track, it's really hard to see trends. But not everybody is data-driven. Not everybody is super structured. So if you know you're not super structured, maybe find somebody who is. And it doesn't have to be come to me. <laughs> it can also be, you know, maybe you have a spouse who is super structured or a teenager, something that can help you out. So make a plan. Be structured about your diabetes management. And I've, when you say things come and go, and if there's one thing that I found that sticks... So actually, there was a research showing that the diets, if we're talking diets, that works are the ones you can stick with. Exactly. That's brilliant research. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's just... obvious, but not really, right? Because we all want a yeah. diet that we're going to drop 10 pounds by next week. Oh, yeah. We all want to find that magic bullet, which doesn't exist. But I think one of the things that I always do on the website and I do on social media and all is I respect that there's some things that really works for certain people. I just also want those people to respect that that won't work for everybody else. So I, for one, my, my approach has always been, you know, if we talk about diet, it's, it's always been like moderate to yeah moderate carbs. I would say a higher protein. That's my approach that works really well for me, but that never means that I'm going to force that on anybody else. I'm going to suggest it <laughs> because I think it's, it's, it's mighty brilliant. Um, but if people are like, well, Christelle, that's fine, but I want to do keto. I'm like, okay, cool. As long as you do it in a healthy and safe way. But I think the only thing I've found consistently across all diets that really is key for people with diabetes, that is low to medium glycemic carbs are really our friend. And for those who don't, well, most people with type 1 probably know what that means. But it just no, means, no, go ahead. It's, it definitely explain that. Well, it just means that, you know, when we choose our carbohydrate sources for us who eat carbs is choose those that won't have an instant spike on our um, blood sugar. So like glucose tabs, they have like a glycemic index of 100. They'll make your blood sugar spike super fast. While a medium glycemic carb like brown rice won't spike it as fast. You make it, you make it more get these like smaller bumps rather than, you know, a huge spike. Right. And, so, and, and it's pretty easy to find the glycemic index. I'll, I'll link something up with the, with the show notes if you want to find out more about how to find that with your foods, because it can be very helpful, especially, you know, it's funny. I remember when Benny was very little, sometimes a lower glycemic food was more difficult to bolus for in a small child, mm -hmm. you know, because the kid weighs like 40 pounds and is super sensitive to insulin and you're trying to time it right. But yeah. as you know, for an adult, it's a little bit easier as, as you know, easier being a relative term. <laughs> everything with type 1 diabetes but sometimes yes. it was like just have that high glycemic thing and we'll we'll just do it now and figure you know it's like it's fine but for adults it's, it's definitely different and it's definitely better for you in the long run you know with with or without type 1 exactly so before i let you go here um how are you doing i mean you've been featured in lots of fitness magazines and you know you're you're really obviously this is your passion how are you and your husband doing how are we doing? We're doing well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any goals for this year? Are you running like three marathons? Are you doing an Ironman? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not into endurance sports. So people always ask me that. I'm like, Do you run? I'm like, No, I prefer not to. <laughs> I just, we all have different things, right? So I keep being invited to these marathon runs. And I'm like, Yeah, not really my thing. <laughs> um, but that's, a, that's the thing with fitness, right? It's all about finding what you love. Yeah. And if for me that's resistance training and i mean i would love to get back on stage again for those who don't know it i've competed in fitness competitions before and that would be a lot of fun so that might be a goal for 2018 but i'm <laughs> i'm not signing that one yet <laughs> uh, <laughs> so so that would be one thing the other thing is for um for tobias and i more for the website part is discontinuing to, you know, offer good content in the next year. We're still going to do, you know, three challenges a year. We have one running here in January. And we're the goal is just to include even more voices, reach even more people, because that's kind of that's my mission. If we can just with the website reach one more person 
give them the tools to go out and be happy and active and not be like super scared of blood sugars all the time, I think we succeeded. You know, that just that incremental person is success in my eyes. And it's so, so that's what we're going to do. It's what we can continue to do. We're going to continue to also build out our social media platforms because and social media there I mean like Instagram and Facebook Mm -hmm. and especially Instagram it's fascinating because it's it's I know it's not a new platform but I meet an incredible amount of people living with diabetes who do not know where to find resources through Instagram Mm -hmm. it seems like there's a whole demographic and maybe it's just a younger I don't know who don't know where to find us but they understand and they use Instagram so I think the more channels that we're on, the broader the reach. Definitely. So we had talked about your uh, January challenge in December, but for people who missed that, as you said, you know, it's going on right now. The next one will be a little bit later in the year. There'll be another opportunity. For sure. Uh, so what we did last year and we're going to do again this year is we're going to have three. That's a plan. So we have a January one. We have a summer one, most likely going to be in May. And the last one is going to be fall. So all of them are going to be, that's a current plan at least, <laughs> uh, four weeks. And it's just, I don't even want to, well, now it's on, now this is on my brain. I don't even want to call it a, like a diabetes health boot camp, but it kind of, it kind of is in the sense that people receive emails every day, you know, with a small challenge or an article to read or something that can help them achieve, you know, being happy and healthy with diabetes. So it's free. People can sign up. People can ignore the emails if they want to. Uh, or they can, you know, do every challenge. It's totally up to the individual. I, I know people who reach out after and say, hey, I saved all the emails. I go flick through them once in a while, and they're still helpful. So that's really cool. And there's also a Facebook group so that you have peer support. Let me just ask you one more question before I let you go. And that is when you do these kinds of challenges or when you work with people and you find that person who says, I I didn't know what to do. I was afraid to exercise. And now I did run that 5K or I am going to the gym. I feel better. What's that like for you? Oh, my gosh. I almost cry every time. (laughs) It makes me so happy. I mean, when when and people I, I really appreciate when people reach out. I mean, those emails or those messages on social media really means a lot to me because, as I said before, my mission is still to reach more and more people. And it's I I truly believe it's not because people don't. Well, it's not because people don't want to. It's because they haven't been given the right information or they haven't. Nobody have given them the support they needed in order to go out and do. Um, So I think. When I hear from from people who had a positive um, experience, it's just it's it confirms that we're down the right path and we'll continue. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. We'll link everything up and uh, we will keep posted on this and maybe we'll revisit this summer and see how the next challenge goes. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Of course, all the information about Diabetes Strong is available in the show notes. Everything we talk about, I try to pop in the show notes and put all the links in there. If you're listening on the Diabetes Connections app, which is a fun little app, it is very easy to find those show notes. And a nice thing about that, too, is it's very easy to text the show to anybody that you want. You can email it, too. And you can also email me directly from the app. I, I like that app. It's fun to use. And it's available for Android or Apple. And I say this uh, every week, but if you listen on social media, it is tough to get to the show notes. If you do that from Facebook or Twitter, often it opens up a player, but you have to go somewhere else to get the show notes. So you can always go back to diabetes-connections.com at any time and get all the links and info for each show. Well, as we all know, the A1C is a very important number. I tell people, if anybody asks, you know, it helps the doctor figure out your blood sugar pattern over the last three months, but that's not really what it is. So after 11 years, I went and looked up the history for today's Now You Know segment brought to you by No Foods. 
My doctor recently asked me to try a gluten-free diet. I don't have celiac, but he suspected that I may have a sensitivity to gluten. After just two weeks, I really felt better, and it's been almost two months now, so I think this is here to stay. And with no foods, I can still enjoy muffins and wraps and cook with breadcrumbs. No Foods is amazing. Their products are grain, gluten, wheat, soy, dairy, and peanut free. They use uh, ingredients like chia and flax, egg whites, almonds, and coconut. Now, I know it sounds like it should taste gross. That was my reaction. I don't know how they do it, but it's yummy stuff. I had two little muffins with my coffee this morning. Check them out at diabetes-connections.com. Click on the No Foods logo. Use the promo code STACY10 to save on your purchase. When we talk about A1C, most of us say just that, right? A1C. But the full name is hemoglobin A1C, and you probably know that. But I wanted to look into a little bit more, just curiosity about, you know, what it was, how they developed it, that sort of thing. So basically, the A1C is, of course, an average measure of blood glucose levels for the previous two to three months. It depends on the protein hemoglobin, and that is in red blood cells. Those are the blood cells that carry oxygen from the lungs to the red rest of the body. Now, hemoglobin reacts with glucose in the blood, and the compound that they form together, containing the glucose, the sugars, attaches to the hemoglobin molecules. Hemoglobin can react with glucose in the blood, and this, this reaction depends on the blood glucose content. So, if your blood glucose levels are high, the amount of hemoglobin that reacts with glucose rises and it accumulates, it stays there. And red blood cells have a lifespan of about 120 days. That's where you get the two to three month figure there. So the amount of this combined molecule, the A1C, gives you your glucose levels over that period of time. So it, it all comes down to what's happening in those red blood cells. That's what's being measured, and that's why it's two to three months, because red blood cells only last. 120 days. That's it. So how did they figure this out? Like a lot of things in medicine, they were they were looking for something else. They were studying a different disease. A research scientist named Anthony Sarami was uh, studying sickle cell anemia at Rockefeller Hospital. They were trying to figure out how to keep the red blood cells from um, sickling. W what happens there is that normally the red blood cells are very flexible and round and move easily through the blood vessels. With sickle cell anemia, the cells become very rigid and sticky. And they're actually shaped like a Sickle. That's like a crescent moon. That's where it gets its name. And they can get stuck, which can block or, or slow down blood flow and oxygen. It's very painful. So they were looking to see why that happened to red blood cells. But what they found was, as they tested different substances affecting the hemoglobin in the blood, it was causing uh, nerve damage and cataracts and other types of complications that were seen with people with uncontrolled diabetes. And when they, they tried to figure out what the reaction was, what was causing the effect, it turned out to be glucose. Now, other researchers had already observed elevated hemoglobin A1C levels in people with diabetes, but Sarami and his colleagues they were the first to propose using it for monitoring glucose control. Um, Sarami, and I hope I'm saying his name right, he's still alive. Maybe we'll try to track him down and talk to him about his work. And he's certainly done a lot more than this. But it's very interesting to see how these things kind of come about. And I hope maybe if, if you didn't know what an A1C really was before, what it was measuring, that helps you out. I will link up an article and more information about uh, these researchers and about the A1C itself and how it's tested at diabetes-connections.com and in the show notes. And hey, now you know. At the very top of the show, I mentioned college and, and some milestones for my family. Now, it's not Benny. Benny is in seventh grade. And while, yeah, of course, he's a genius. He's not ready for college yet. Um, no, this is my daughter. I have a 16-year-old daughter. And Benny's bar mitzvah, in the time-shifted way that this show goes, has already happened. So I'm taping it before his bar mitzvah, trying to get ready for everybody coming in. But you're, you'll be listening to it afterwards. So that's the biggest milestone in our family right now. And I'll tell you more about that next week and how it went. I'm so excited and nervous. And so is he. It's, it's going to be wonderful. But Two days after everybody leaves and gets out of here, we are meeting with my daughter's college counselor. Yeah, we're going to school. She's a junior. She's taken a bunch of the PSAT and the ACTs and all that. Leah's my child who does not like to be in the spotlight, so um, I don't talk about her much on social media. Um, I don't talk about her too much here, of course, either. 
But I'm sharing this because I'm so excited to start this process with her. I think it's going to be really interesting. And I'm really proud of her already. She's, I can brag for a minute. She's got great grades and great test scores. And it, it, it's really going to be her choice of where she wants to go. It, you know, these kids have, some of them have no idea what to study. So it's going to be fun to kind of see her narrow it all down. But I bring it up here too, because of course, in the back of my mind will be college and diabetes. Sure, I, I could pretend it's not. I could pretend that I'm, I'm focusing solely on, you know, on Leah. And of course, when I'm with her, that's what we're going to be doing. But I know myself and I know that when I'm looking through the materials and I'm thinking about the application process, in the back of my mind, I am also going to be thinking about doing this with Benny and hopefully learning from Leah's experience about what we want to do and, and what is able to be done. And we've been pretty fortunate. You know, having an older child who doesn't have type 1 has been helpful in a way. I, I hope this makes sense in that you realize that not everything is about diabetes. There are some developmental milestones that happen that you think you want to blame on diabetes, but it really has nothing to do with it. It's like normal teenage stuff, you know, like moodiness and uh, not wanting to be with you, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. But it's been, it's been interesting in a real education to watch her hit all of these milestones and knowing that we're going to go through them again with diabetes. And in a way, it's made it a little bit easier. Um, and I, I appreciate that she has paved the way. And I tell her all the time that I'm proud of her and she knows. So if she was listening, she'd be rolling her eyes right now and just like, Mom, let's get on with it. Um, so I'll keep you posted on that too. And of course, I can't let a moment go by without mentioning the College Diabetes Network. Great group of kids doing terrific work on college campuses around the country and also helping parents because they have great resources for parents, which will help you let your child go to college while not worrying yourself needlessly, ha ha ha, and nagging them nonstop. So that's a tough road, but I think the College Diabetes Network can really help. Love to hear more from you. You can always reach me, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com, S-T-A-C-E-Y, or jump into the Facebook group. It is Diabetes Connections, the group. I would love to see you there. And as always, thank you to John Buchanan, our editor. He is at Audio Editing Solutions. Always appreciate his help. And thank you so much for listening. I love doing this show. And it is great to spend an hour every week, almost an hour, sometimes over an hour with people who get it. I really appreciate your time. I know it's valuable. Thanks for spending some of it with me. I'm Stacey Sims, and I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.